In today's art workshop, we're going to be drawing traditional crane from Japanese art. And there's a reason for that, a connection. Thanks everybody for tuning in. I'm Christopher Epling. Uh, we at PacTV love to have you here. Rolling through these tutorials is really cool. It's a great opportunity. I'm very thankful to be able to do it. And your involvement is everything. So if you were to create something at home, inspired by or maybe even following along with the exact tutorial of what we're doing and you'd like to share it with everybody i know i would love to see it all the producers here would love to see it and we'd love to share it with our audience so send it to us um, we have an email address and you can see it there on your screen just send it over to us and include your name you want to include your age or anything about yourself you want to share with others we'd love to we'd love to do that now traditional cranes when you think about that in terms of um, japanese art they're everywhere if you've looked at any type of um, art from Japan, you see a lot of these um, really ornate landscape drawings. And usually at the top of these drawings, there's some sort of Japanese writing. Sometimes they incorporate poems or sometimes they incorporate different types of, um, 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 you know, maybe a saying or, or even uh, um, a little stanza of something that, that is in relation to uh, nature or, or what inspired the artist to create the work. Now cranes, believe it or not, are making their way and have been for many years here in Eastern Kentucky. So you may see these flying over. I remember the first time that I saw a crane flying over, it was up near um, um, where, I, where I live, up, up, up near Elkhorn City. And I saw this, this giant winged something and it looked to me like a pterodactyl. And uh, I was convinced that, yeah, okay, there, there's a pterodactyl, but it turns out it's just a water crane. So I don't really know the exact species or anything else that live around here. I probably should have figured that out beforehand, but I know you've probably seen these birds. And these birds are held in high regard in a lot of cultures. They're not just seen as being, wow, that's a strange looking bird flying. They, they appreciate them and re their relation to how they contribute to the environment and what they mean to the people in that culture. So today we're gonna to be drawing a crane. Now this crane is, a um, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's a snow crane. I'm not really 100% sure, but it is a different type of crane than what we normally see around here. Uh, what we see around here have large beaks or almost like a pelican type crane, I guess, and um, very, very large um, birds. And these birds have very long legs, which make them ideal for standing up in water and adding different types of environments around them. And we're gonna be using a medium today that I'm really excited about, something we've used before in the art workshop, and if you get a chance, you can see those past episodes. Just go to our YouTube channel, TV 99 search for it on YouTube. You'll see a playlist on there, and that's the Art Workshop playlist. And there's tons and tons of tons, over 70 videos, 70 episodes of the Art Workshop. So I like to talk about materials because this isn't the most important thing, but it is important because if you don't have these at home, it's okay. All you really need is some paper and a pencil and an eraser. If you have a pen, that's good too, but that's all you really need to follow along. But I like talking about materials because when I started out as a young artist, especially here in the mountains and not having access maybe to, nowadays you do, but with the internet and, and different types of uh, hobby stores and, and craft stores and craft departments in stores, there's tons of ways to get materials. When I was younger, as a young artist, I didn't have those same materials. I sound like an old man now, like one of those guys. It's like, when I was little, I walked. But anyway, you get the point. Uh, these materials sometimes were hard to come by. And I really didn't even know, even if I had access to these materials, I didn't know what they were at all. Um, but talking about materials helps young artists to identify what it is they might would like to use to create their art with. That's the main reason. And today we're talking about uh, water soluble graphite pens, or I guess pencils you should say, right? And it doesn't really matter what brand you use. It doesn't matter um, the type of uh, maybe, um, you know, um, um, brand, right? It doesn't matter. The goal is though, is to get one that is water soluble. So what this is, is graphite, like a pencil, but once you sketch with this and apply different shading with it, you can take water to it and it mixes like watercolor. It's amazing. The cool thing about these pencils is, and I have actually a few different brands here, and I'll just mention a couple. We don't endorse any, but just so you know kind of who makes them. Uh, Faber-Castell is a um, brand of pencils. And then also Generals, you have Generals. And Faber-Castell has a set that you can get, and then also Generals does too. But in the set, the reason I mention a set is that in those, all of these that you see here have different type of lead. And on the pencil, there's a number followed by a letter. And that signifies how much pigment is in that lead. So 
if you have a 2B pencil, just like your HB or 2H you have in school, uh, you have a 6B. The Bs are very dark. You also have H's, HB, that's kind of right in the middle. And then you have a 4B and an 8B. So these are all pretty dark. You have one that's kind of in the middle, and then we go very dark from there. These are tones. We talk a lot about tones in the art workshop too. Now General's brand, this is called Sketch and Watch, they come with numbers only. So this is a number 588. That just means that probably 587 is a lighter tone of this. And then there's also um, um, different types of uh, brushes that you can use. So you can get a traditional brush, right? So that's a small tip round brush. You can get one of those and you can use a little tiny reservoir with water in it. After you sketch, dip it, apply it, and it blends it. That's one way of doing it. Or you can get one of these aqua pens. They're really cheap. They come with nothing in them. So what you have to do is open it up, put water in here. So as you go and you're uh, applying water to your drawing, you don't have to keep dipping it and dipping it. You just squeeze a little bit, put a little bit of tension in here on this uh, reservoir part. Water flows through to the synthetic brush hairs and it enables you to mix really well. For the purpose of today's episode, I'm going to be using one of these, but you do not need these to work. All right, so I move this off to the side. A couple more tools that I'm going to be using today is a couple of pens. I have two versions of a standard pen. You have a brush pen and then you have a normal felt tip pen. The felt tip pen is very small tip. So just like you have variation in tones signified by the number and a letter, you have markings on these pens as well that tell you what it is. This one's just small S. So it's a small uh, felt tip marker. This, of course, is the brush pen. So if I were to open it up, you can see the tip is very fine, but this is actually a brush. So I can go over here and make very, very, very broad lines or very, 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 very thin lines, okay? Almost to the point you can't really see it. I'm gonna be using these two here, and then I'm also gonna be using this right here, which is a alcohol-based brush marker. And what this is, is a cool gray. So just like all of these signifiers that tell you uh, what you're working with, these pens have it too. This is cool gray number two. That means there's a cool gray number one, a cool gray number three, four, and five. This is very light, but I want this light tone because I don't have a real, real, real light uh, graphite mark, um, a pencil. I want to be sure and have that. Now the last thing I'm going to be using, I know there's a lot here, but uh, just in case you're interested, this is like, again, we don't endorse any brands of anything, okay? But um, this is Faber-Castell. This is colored pencils. Now, the cool thing about these colored pencils is usually colored pencils are wax-based. That means the pigment in here is made up of wax. So when you go and you blend them, you have to keep blending them on top of another color. So you put down a light blue, get a little bit darker, go over top of the light blue. You can do these the same way. You can work with these pencils the same way but this has a variation in it. If you get one that's oil-based color pencil, you can do something really cool. You can blend them like you do traditional color pencils, or you can get a little bit of Gamsol, G-A-M-S-O-L, turpentine, some sort of a paint thinner, which can be very toxic. I highly recommend going with something with Gamsol or linseed oil, and these are less toxic. And what you could do is apply a little bit of that Gamsol to your brush, and you can go over top of your color pencils, this type of color pencil, and you can blend them. So we're going to be not, we're not going to be using any Gamsol today. This is more for highlights of what we're going to be doing. And we don't need all these colors either. But if you do like colors, they come with a lot of different ones. So each one of those are signified by a number. In case you need to replace one, you use one more than the other, you can get them. If you get one of these sets, any set of any color pencils, sometimes they come with different techniques, a little book that tells you how to use it. The cool thing is you can erase them, you can blend them, you can use different methods of application such as a sander or a rubbing stick. There's tons of ways to use this medium. For us today, we're going to be very basic. We're just going to be coloring with it and blending a little bit, okay? So here's the tools. Now we're ready to start. Starting out this is going to be the area here that I'm going to be drawing in. So think of this like if you were to take a piece of paper at home, lay it down tall ways, right? It's more tall than it is wide. And we're going to start off in the middle of our page. 
right here in the middle. And I use a method called the Marvel method. We went over this a lot. But I want you to go ahead in the middle of your page and you're going to draw an oval right there. Hopefully you can see that pretty good. Coming out from the oval, I want you to draw a straight line. This is the beak of the crane coming out like this. So this little line comes out and back in. So you form this kind of like a little block sticking off of the oval. Now the crane's head is not going to be this big, but we need this here to show where all the area for the feathers will be. The head actually comes up, and you go ahead and trace along with me. It comes down like this, and it makes a curve, right? The cranes have this very, very, very distinct curve line to their neck. Come back over here, just below this block you've made, and you're going to draw a line coming back in in this direction now, like this. And what that does is it forms the under part of the crane's mouth and head. Up, around like an S, down, and then this line here. Now what we can do, eraser too, if you have an, you've got to have an eraser. So if you have an eraser pencil and a pen and paper, you can pretty much follow along with any one of these episodes. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that side of the oval there. And what I want to do now is work primarily on the body of the crane. So the body of the crane, you want to make an oval that's slanted. So take an oval and turn it on its side. Sketch that out lightly on your page like that. The neck of the crane will come down and then we're going to have some feathers protruding out right here. Okay. So you can go ahead and sketch a few of these little like lines, jagged lines going down this side. Once we have that, I want you to jump back over to where you drew this oval and you're going to draw this line coming down to represent some back feathers. So a few more of these little jagged lines coming back up. Once we have these jagged lines, we pretty much have the body of our crane now. You can seal it off with a line right here. Don't make the body too thick because you want it to have long legs coming down and going into the water. Now as I'm drawing, and as I can start to kind of put more detail into my work, I erase some of these lines. I don't need them anymore. I've already established where the work's going to go. I know where the line is and all the features. So go ahead and erase some of those. Because if you have those hanging around too much, what happens is things start to blend into one another and it becomes a little confusing. Jump down at the bottom of the crane and you're going to draw a line coming straight down, just like this. Straight down from the crane. I want you to fill that in though. Don't just leave one line. So you're going to draw a parallel line or at least one that becomes a parallel line coming down and follow that line all the way down the bottom of your page like that. This is actually going to extend outside of the picture frame. Now the back leg, well actually in this case it's the front leg, uh, is going to be bent. So this is going to come down. So draw a line coming down in this direction. And now this is going to come out towards the front. At an angle so it's going to come back this direction like this. Once we have that drawn you can go ahead and do the same thing you did here by putting a little bit of thickness to the beginning of that line and then a parallel line running straight down to the foot. Now we have the claws, not claws I guess, the, the little toes of the crane I guess you could say coming down. The uh, toes, I guess cranes have toes and there's just three of those one two three and that should be good. Now we have the basic features, but there's a couple of areas that we want to be sure and have uh, be distinguishable in our drawing. The first is right up here, just at the base of the neck. You should have a line coming up and then arching down. So it's a little bit of a bend right there. Okay. And again, once you've established a line and you can get rid of some of these others. Remember I had you draw the giant, this large oval at the beginning that I said was too big. The reason for that the line that's coming down the back of the head, connecting to the neck here, this line is actually to help us know where the feathers are. The real meat, I guess, of the crane will probably stop about right here, right? And then come down. But the feathers are protruding out from it quite a bit. And we want first to have a line coming out and back up. So that's one kind of large feather coming off the top of the crane's head. And then add a second one just below it, like that. And then once you have those two, be sure and keep that nice rounded S shape to the back of the head up here. But you want to kind of go ahead and 
make that a little more narrow. It doesn't have to be so wide. That oval, though, really helped to guide where our lines would be and where the feathers are going to be out. So you have two feathers sticking out here, and then the head of the crane coming around, and the neck of the crane coming down, like that. And you can continue to work with it and get it the shape that you want, as long as you have a kind of a nice S curve to this, especially right here in the front, then that's really what you need. Sometimes I will draw a line and I'll see where it's at. If I want to go back in and work with it a little more, I can. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and put some more feathers. I want to make these lines pretty distinguishable. Come out and back in towards the body like that. Okay. Now the, the eye of the crane is pretty small. It's about right here. So you can go ahead and put that in there, a little circle. Okay. And once you have that, the beak of the crane comes back into the head a little bit. It doesn't just stop right here at the end. It kind of comes out and then it also comes in into the head just a little bit here. Now let's work a little bit on our background. So we have this crane representing the foreground of our drawing. We need some stuff in the background. Real simple stuff. Japanese art, sometimes simplicity is more important than all these complex things. What I mean by that is, all we really need is a branch coming up. So draw a straight line coming up this way like that. Once you have that drawn, draw a few lines coming out from it. Different directions like that. Now, with this being drawn, we want to add something down in this corner too because it kind of balances things off a little bit. And a lot of times in art, you'll see that. Down here, we're going to put a couple of flowers. So just draw like a guitar pick shape first, then another one, and do two more, kind of making up the petals of a flower right here. Okay, you should see four of them. And then draw a little line coming out from that, little tiny segment broken and then one more up this way like this with another line coming out from it these lines that you have extruding from these primary lines you've drawn need to have a little bit of um, a little bit of something on there such as color or something so we need to put something on there that can hold color so i'm going to put a few leaves you don't have to put a lot just a few here and there they don't necessarily have to make um, this you know filled out completely, just a few. And the other thing we're going to do is in the background, what's happening way out here where there's white behind our crane, we don't want to add a whole lot of detail there because like I said, a lot of the Japanese type style traditional artwork doesn't have a whole lot going on in it. But we will put a line representing water, actually a few lines coming back this way like that. And that's all we're going to do. That's our entire line work for this drawing. Now there's features that we'll add, of course, in here when we start to color, such as the wing and then a few lines of color for the beak and then a line coming back this way. We'll worry all about that in a second. What I'd like to do now, though, is go ahead after we've established all of our line work and I'm going to jump in with my brush pen and I'm going to trace over all the pencil lines that I want to keep and I'll get rid of the lines I don't. For the lines making up these branches sticking out, you don't have to draw two lines to make up those branches. So it's not really two parallel lines, it's a straight line. You can get that by black. If you have a uh, brush pen at home, or if you have even just a felt tip pen at home or a Sharpie, that'll work perfectly. Come out like this, a few more leaves, just trace over these lines. I'm gonna do the um, crane next. So the feather coming up to the top of the head, and then a little bit of an arch here out to the beak like that. And then of course the lines making up the back part of the um, beak here. Now I'm making these little tiny cross hatches and little tiny, tiny lines for feathers. And you don't have to seal them all off either. You can just make a little line there. What I mean by that is like a line and a line and a line and a line because we really don't have to make this look you know, completely 3D. It's not really necessarily about that. It's about just giving the impression that these are feathers coming out. They're very light. When you draw two lines representing something like these legs here, two lines making up that, it gives a heaviness to it. That's the best way I can describe it. But we want this part to be really light. The wing, of course, these a little bit more. There we go. 
and then trace over the lines for the leg, both sides here, and then down here at the uh, um, foot, and then this well, two lines making up the back leg. And now for the water, literally you're just putting some straight kind of these jagged lines that go back and forth with your with your pen, go back and forth and make some lines kind of going off. Get lighter or thinner with your line if you can, the further away you go. Now let's go ahead and trace these leaves real fast. Then we're at the point we can start putting in some color and some, and some grays. Another thing you're going to find with Japanese art, and, and traditional art anyway, um, and, and I think also some modern art too, although I'm not real familiar with a lot of uh, mar current modern art in Jap Japan, but um, what you'll find with a lot of traditional stuff is that there's minimal color. There's not a ton of color in these, in these paintings. And, you know, I guess if you, if you know much about Japanese culture, my brother used to really love uh, Japanese culture and, he, um, he, he would talk sometimes about the, uh, you know, how the minimalist, they don't use a lot, but with what they use, they really make it uh, profound and stand out in their art. So now we've traced over all of our lines. We have this nice crane standing in this, maybe a stream, it might be a lake. And what we can do now is we let this dry. So go ahead and I'm trying to fan it a little bit. Uh, get your eraser out. This is a kneaded eraser. So not that it's much needed, although it is. Ha, ha, right. uh, this is called kneaded because you can knead it like you can dough. So you can roll it back and forth like this and get it to be like a little bit flatter shape. And then you can take it and erase like you normally would with any type of block eraser or maybe the end of a pencil. And you at home, if you don't have this, it's okay. Use the end of your pencil. Just get rid of those, all those lines. Because once you've traced over your work, you really don't need these pencil lines anymore. Plus the pencil lines, all they're going to end up doing after you put a little bit of color in here is either blend with the color, making it a dull gray, or end up bleeding over somehow and showing through your, through your color. So get rid of all the lines you can the best you can. I'm going to go over this with a kneaded eraser too. Now the paper I'm using, which I didn't talk about, this is a vellum surface. And what that means is the surface of this paper is very smooth and it loves when you draw a pencil line on there to keep it on there. Especially if you've done what I do, and especially in the setting of the show, I have to press down a little bit harder so you can see these pencil lines pretty good. And when you do that on a vellum surface page, you actually create ridges in your, in your, in your paper, grooves. And that really likes to hold in a lot of the graphite. All right, got our pencil shavings nice and moved off to the side and now we have a flat, kind of like a coloring book page, right? It's really what it looks like. Now using these pencils, like I said at the beginning of the show, we have a variation. So I'm gonna start out with the lightest one, which is HB. And I'm gonna go over the back of the crane. Go down the back of the crane towards the tip down here. And then up the back of the neck. I'm making a circle motion with this. so. If you had your pencil at home, I'm literally going in this motion like this. And what that does is it helps you to fill up that area pretty good. This is a very, very light tone of this type of medium, but we need a lighter tone first, and then we'll go darker. You have two options after you've done this. Now for the wing, make these jagged shapes. You're not doing circles here. You're going back and forth more there. But you have two options after you've put, pay, placed this medium down. Your first option is you can go ahead with, with some water and blend that, or you can keep going and adding some more tones to it, then blend it. For the purpose of this, I'm going to keep going with a few more tones. Then I'll blend, then I may add more. On the leaves, just a little bit of this gray, back and forth motion, Place it wherever you want. Just make sure you feel a little bit of gray on most of your leaves. You don't have to do all of them. Even the flower here, put a little bit on the inside of the petals towards the main part in the middle. Just a little bit. And then the water coming down this way, I'm going back and forth again. I'm not following the lines I drew. 
uh, precisely or trying to, I want to add a few more lines on top of them, right? So we're just back and forth. Now we'll lay this to the side now. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and grab um, the next tone up. So I have a 2B, a 4B, 6B, and a 8B. So I guess I'll use a 2B. And for this one, I'm going to jump inside here, inside of the areas where the legs are. And I'm going to put a really dark, dark application of this um, pencil on here. So it's real dark, push down hard for the uh, inside of the legs. Same thing around the edge of the wing, back and forth lines, up like just almost like you're going back and forth with it. So you have the circle and then you have this, right? And that's what we're doing here, back and forth. You want to make sure you keep that nice curve of the wing right there. Now there's a darker area up here, going back towards this feather, one kind of solid block shape there. A little bit of black coming out into the beak. And then you also have a darker hue. This um, should work here to get this around the neck. So going down the back of the neck like that. And also very lightly on this area, back and forth lines, putting a little bit here and there. Now, if you don't have any of these pencils at home, you can actually, just by how much pressure you put down with your pencil, get a nice shade. Or I've seen some students, some artists, and I've done it too, will actually shade it in with a pencil and take your finger, smudge it. You can smudge it or you can get what's called a smudge stick, which will keep your finger from getting all that graphite on it and you can actually use that stick. All right, so I've applied two different tones here. I'm gonna leave this alone for a second. What I'm gonna do now though, is over on my colored pencils, I'm pulling out a very light pink color, okay? This is almost like a, a salmon color. And I'm gonna go over my flower and I'm really pressing down harder on the inside. And as I get out towards the edges, I'm not pressing down as hard like that. Add a little bit of this up here too with your leaves. And you don't even really need, sometimes you don't even need any lines. You can just throw some color in here and there around your line art too. You don't always have to have it, you know, blocked in with a line. Just a little bit of color. This could be maybe some different flowers off in the distance, or at least further away from this. You can't see the lines very well making them up. You can see the colors. Now I'm gonna pull a little bit darker tone of that color now. I'm gonna use a, uh, this looks like a nice um, red. And I'm gonna, instead of this real light pink now, I'm gonna go back in with this red and all the areas where I press down really hard with the pink, I'm gonna color over top of with this red. And I'm gonna leave the lighter portions um, light. I'm not going to color over it. Let me put a little bit just on the edges of some of these I've done in the background. Not all of them, just a few here and there like that. Once you have that drawn, we're not really going across the whole spectrum of colors here with our um, color pencils. We only needed a few because there's minimal color in Japanese art. I forgot a little bit of pink here by the beak right there. Now I also want to use some yellow and I'm probably not going to use the bright yellow. If you have a choice, you may want to use something that's maybe closer to a, um, a light brown even. But I want to go out here on the beak and put some color coming out in this direction. So we have a little bit of color for the beak. And then the rest of this pretty much is black and white minus a few shades of this red and uh, pink. I may go ahead and put just a little bit more shading on some of these branches or flowers, or leaves, I'll get it right in a second. Just so that's blended in a little bit more on the areas where it's darker, like that. So you can still see the white of the paper. And the last thing I wanna do is just keep it very, very simple. I wanna jump in with a nice light blue color and I want to go on my water, put a few lines, not many, a few here, few there, maybe a few on the side too, like that. So you can see that this is very, very, very minimal application of color. 
But now what the exciting point is, I get to use the marker. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to jump in now. I'm sorry, the water brush. And I'm going to start to blend these grays in. And what you're going to see is even if you're taking, let's say, a reservoir of water and you're dipping it, you're going to notice something start to happen. As you're starting to color in, I'm sorry, to wash over um, the grays you put, you keep some on the brush. And so you see that little bit of gray tone right there I just used? I have nothing on my brush, but because I am tracing over and getting pigment on my brush, it stays on there. That's a good thing though, because what you can do is continue to work with the pigment. So you get, you know, kind of make two, uh, you know, you get two effects from one application. So I'm going in now and I'm pulling out these colors and now I can, without having any applied any type of pigment to the branches, I can pull this and just kind of trace along them a little bit like this. Not a whole lot, just a little bit here and there. Over on this side, the same thing. I'm not coloring in the entire leaf either. I'm pretty much going around one edge, leaving white. There's a lot of white in Japanese art. You'll notice um, that they leave a lot of the, of the white or paper showing sometimes, or sometimes it's a white pigment. Now on this flower here, notice how I'm just making some large blotches of the gray, and then in other areas, I'm not really blending as much on the corners here. Really neat thing too is if you ink over this with a with a brush pen, you also start to pull some of the ink that hasn't dried. That's a really neat effect that starts to happen. Especially for the feathers, which you'll see here. The feathers are real important and keeping them really nice and light is also real important. And you can extend them out more. And then also around the beak, the eye area, Top of the head has that very light gray applied to it. And then under the neck, see we put no shading there originally, but because of what's happening with our, with our uh, pigment in our brush, staying in our brush, we can actually blend like that. So it starts to work pretty nice. And if you, if you give access to um, just a bottle of ink, you can actually get a really neat effect by putting water um, in a bottle cap, put a dab of ink in it. And the more ink that you put in there though, of course the darker that's gonna be. But if you have a few bottle caps laid out and water in each one of them, and maybe in one bottle cap you put one dab of ink and the next you put two and the next you put more and then more. What happens is in each one of those little caps, you have a different variation of gray or black. And you can take that then and start to paint with it. So you really don't need all these fancy mediums, I mean, um, materials, you can really get the effect from these by using just common sense with things. Um, the legs have to be very dark. As you come down, watch kind of going over top of your other line, leave a little bit of white showing through as you get towards the end, toward the feet, like this. A little bit of white there. And then what you want to do too is your water that you've put down, I'm going to actually get this wet a little bit, get some of that gray off of it. I'm going to go back and forth like I did originally, back and forth, and I'm going to go over this now, blending these grays. So you still get this back and forth line, but you're starting to blend some too. Back and forth, back and forth, like that. There we go. Maybe pull some of these lines even from out here. And that's what you're left with. You're left with a very minimal, um, in terms of how much color we've used, uh, painting, but at the same time, it looks almost as if, you know, all of these things are filling up the space well. Like there's, there could be a lot of things behind these leaves out into the distance, even though there's nothing there. Your eye kind of wants to fill that in. Your imagination does. You can keep going if you wanted to. Um, I think now I'm going to use a very dark, dark hue of this. So I'm going to actually go all the way to 8B. And I want to put some shadows in here. And so what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to go over certain areas that I want to be very dark, especially around the edge of the wing here is one area. And then I also want this line making up 
the feather up here to be dark. It's actually a line, it's actually a color of the crane right here extending out towards the eye. And I want to put some shadows of some of these leaves too. So literally solid black shapes that resemble the shapes that you have up here that you can see some gray in. This gives like a silhouette and you'll find this also in a lot of Japanese art are silhouetted colors on top of um, areas that doesn't have a lot of color to it. So you have solid blacks on top of very light pinks, light blues, dashes of yellow, and then you have some very solid, solid black shapes. Maybe down at the bottom, put one right here and here. I'm coating all this in, and I may take the brush over top of this, but I really don't have to because at this point, you know, this is pretty much um, going to speak for itself because it's solid. But if you wanted to put some black on there, you can. So you can kind of see how that starts to give the effect that there's some shadow going on. It fills things out a little bit. But like I said earlier, you, you know, if you're trying to go for this look, you don't really want a whole lot, a whole lot of color. So around the edges of some of these branches, around the edges of some of these leaves I've already drawn, I'm just drawing another leaf like this, and then I'm coloring that in solid, just like that. And it kind of helps to fill it out. Now, there's some areas you can see that maybe needs more than others. And you can go back over your drawing after you stand back and look at it. You can say, well, this area might need a little more attention. This area might, so on and so forth. You can continue to work with the drawing as much as you want. But you kind of get the effect, though, of a, a Japanese traditional artwork. Always sign your work. Be sure to do that. So put my name on here. And if you wanted to, since we have a little bit more time, I brought in this brush marker and I'm going to go over these areas here that I've colored in solid, but I'm going to take this very light, light, light gray that I showed you earlier. And I'm actually going to start to go over some of the areas of the crane back here towards the back of the head. And I'm just, what I'm doing is just touching this up some, making sure that it's filled up a little bit in the areas I want it to be filled up in. And you don't want to use too much of this, but it helps if you don't have, let's say, this lot of a gray in these pencils. Go back to my brush marker again. Now here we go. This is where we're going to really pull out the black on these silhouetted leaves. Go over top of it with, with your water. And, and like I said, you know, once you start to apply this on here, you're going to get that pigment in your brush. So you can continue to work with it. So you could basically, you know, fill in this leaf here and jump up here and put a silhouetted leaf there. One down here maybe. And sometimes you don't really need to attach them to anything. You could just put them kind of off in the distance. It's a little, a little bit of some um, leaves kind of hanging out back there in the background. Down at the bottom. I fill in a little more around this flower. The more, um, the darker tones that you use around the flower, the more the flower is going to stick out. Up here at the top, I have a few more leaves that I haven't gotten to yet. I'm being very loose with it, that means I'm not, you know, I'm having fun with it. So I'm just applying it loosely on here just to make sure that I cover this area up. And now what I'll do is I'm going to go around the drawing with a very, very light tone. I think I'm going to use a, there's 2B and there's HB. I think I'll use the uh, 2B again. And I'm going to go around the edge with a very light shade of gray all the way around it. Literally all around my drawing. Just like this, on the tape. So if you have tape down on a piece of paper, you can get a neat effect here at the end. I'm going all around it even around the water, like this, around the edges. And now, I take my brush pen, make sure that it's nice and clean, and I'm gonna blend this gray coming into the drawing to the center of the drawing, all the way around it. And you're gonna pick up some of the colors that you've placed down already, so you gotta be careful with this. If you go over too much of it, You'll get a lot of pigment in your brush 
and then it'll actually go in and start to affect your drawing, especially in this area where there's a lot going on over here. See how that's pulled some of that out? There's a reason I'm doing this. I'm framing my picture now using gray like this, framing it up because when we remove the tape here in a second, we're gonna have a nice clean line. And you gotta take your brush over, squeeze it a little bit, get some of that pigment out of there. It's a very light, light gray. It's hardly noticeable, right now anyway, unless I get a hold of that beak real bad and mess it up pretty bad, which could happen. Grab some of it, that's okay. We can adjust that later. Coming down the branch and into the middle of the drawing like this. Watercolor is a, is a preferred um, choice of some of these early Japanese masters that would create these really beautiful scenic. And this is, of course, nothing like theirs, but if you were to see some of this early Japanese art, you would see some of these very beautiful scenic type paintings. And they would use either watercolor or water based inks. And uh, their, their application of color is just, it's amazing, those early artists. Right here on the beak, you notice I've kind of smudged that out some. So that's, that's a good example of allowing your stuff to kind of dry a little more first. But it'll work okay. But once we have this done, now I'm going to remove this tape. And it should block out our drawing. So even though that gray is very white, I mean very light, now you should be able to see it once it's compared to the outer edge where the white is, a little bit better. I don't want to rip it too fast because it can pull part of the drawing away. Get the top two. Anytime you're working with watercolor or any, any medium that's water-based, you can use painter's tape. I wouldn't recommend any other tape really because this removes pretty easily. And as long as you fill in all the space of the area you're drawing in, you can remove that then and you have a nice border to it. If you go really slow, you can actually remove it and uh, frame it and it looks almost like it's matted in. But there we go. So if I were to take this artwork and cut this out now and frame it, I would want to frame it with maybe an edge to it because this white edge helps to pull out those grays, even though that's so light you could barely see it earlier. Now you can, you can see it a lot better. So I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. This has been a very uh, fun tutorial for me. I love to work in traditional um, methods and watercolor and water-based ink, soluble inks and those things are fun to work with. Uh, the minimalist approaches kind of goes in line with the cartooning side of, of my own work because I really like minimal, fun, loose art like that. Um, also I have a high respect for the masters too because I couldn't do that to save my life. But. There's a mastery for this as well, though. So thanks for um, uh, joining along. I hope you've uh, had fun today. I hope you've learned something. I've learned something. I've learned that you should let your artwork dry really well before you start putting more medium down. I learn that every time I do the show, though. It's not fun today. So thank you so much for tuning in. Please share your work. Like I said, we'd love to share it. Um, just send it to us at our email address, and we'll include it on the next show. So thanks so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the crane. If you see a crane now, again, out in the wild, it's not, it's not a pterodactyl. I, I know that now for sure. But think about how um, some artists have used their environment and things in nature uh, to represent um, you know, themselves in the region they're from. And you could do that from here too. You don't have to be in Japan, right? All right, thanks again for tuning in. Until next time, I'm Christopher Eppling. And remember, keep drawing.